icy heart for the lost continent of Atlantis. The Hollywood star who was a teenage spy. The monstrous regiment of Russian fighting women. And the angelic host that saved the day moments. A new kind of war, conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest. Incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons in the history of warfare. What is even crazier is it seems to work. <sighs> Mysterious mm. events. It does sound crazy, but we have eyewitnesses that claim that's what happened. Unexplained phenomena. They've never seen anything like this before. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. Bernteroda, Germany, April 1945. American forces pushing to Berlin discover an ammunitions cache buried deep within a mine. One of the American officers notices a brick wall painted to match the exact colour of the mine shaft. And when they begin trying to knock it down, they realise that it's five feet thick. So what are the Germans trying to hide? What they discover behind the wall is like something straight out of Indiana Jones. It's a huge cave crammed with stolen artworks. Masses of treasure. Tapestries. Paintings. Crates full of books. Jewellery, sculpture, you name it, it's there. But that's not all. Then they discover a side chamber. Hung with Nazi banners. And in it, they find four tombs. The tombs contain the relics of Germany's most famous Teutonic warlords, including those of Graf von Hindenburg himself. The final coffin is empty, but it has an elaborate plate engraved with the name of the warlord that it was intended for. Adolf Hitler. This is all part of a sinister Nazi plan to cement their dominance of the world. And it hinges on one thing. They have to find Atlantis. was written by the Nazis, it would have sounded like this. Because most Nazis believed in world ice theory. World ice theory was an eccentric theory of creation. Once the planet was ruled over by an Aryan super race of Nordic, blue-eyed, blonde-haired people who alone possessed the genius to create civilization. Until there was this massive flood that destroyed their civilization and spread them all over the globe. There was a name for this proto Aryan civilization, a name that resonates in the history Atlantis. Atlantis is this fabled island kingdom that was supposedly destroyed at the very dawn of Greek civilization. It featured in the writings of Plato and Aristotle, who described it as a, a vast continent beyond the Pillars of Hercules. That, of course, is the Straits of Gibraltar. So we're talking somewhere in the Atlantic. At the forefront of this drive to rationalize the Third Reich's racist supremacism is the Nazi's lunatic-in-chief, Heinrich Himmler. Himmler is fanatically pro-Aryan. 
He believes in all of this mysticism surrounding the German people. In 1935, Himmler decides to set out on proving that the Germans are the master race who created human civilization. To do this, he creates a secret organization called the Arnhem, which means inherited from our forefathers, dedicated to finding archaeological proof of the area. The Arnhemerbe are essentially the baddies from Raiders of the Lost Ark. Their primary goal is to go out into the world and pilfer any artefacts that they believe will link them to an Aryan master race. But archaeological expeditions to the far corners of the world cost money. And money is in short supply. So Himmler funds the Arnhemerbe through the ultimate stealth tax. In 1936, Himmler approaches a German inventor called Anton Leubel. Who has come up with the idea of a reflective bicycle pedal. Himmler decides to make it mandatory for all German bicycles, thereby making Anton Leubel a huge amount of money. There is a small catch for Leubel. He has to pay a percentage of all his sales back to Himmler. Enabling Himmler to siphon off a huge percentage of the profits to fund the Arnhemerbe. Now armed with funds, the Arnhemerbe can begin its thousand year mission to search the world for ancient civilizations and prove they are linked to the Aryan cause. And to do that, they need to find Atlantis. This is music to the ears of General Franco in Spain. Franco needed the Nazis to provide him with military support during the Spanish Civil War. But to get Hitler's support, it will be easier first to get the ear of Himmler. And if you've got Hitler on side, you've got the whole German war machine. Himmler's obsession with Atlantis might just provide Franco with the leverage he needs. To draw him in, the Spanish send an embassy that claims to have evidence that the Canary Islands could be the remains of Atlantis. The Canaries are a Spanish territory sitting off the west coast of Africa, just a few hundred miles south of the Straits of Gibraltar. From the air, the fragmented archipelago looks like the blasted ruins of a devastated island. Himmler was absolutely intrigued because early travellers to the Canary Islands reported seeing local people with blonde hair and white skin. And furthermore, Himmler also finds out that there have been some mummies found there with golden tresses. It looks to him as if this really could be the birthplace of Aryanism. What Himmler might like to know, or possibly not, was that the Canary Islands were actually thrust up due to volcanic activity. They weren't the, the, the ruins or remains of anywhere. And that the original inhabitants were actually Berbers. So he would have been very disappointed to have found that out. Himmler gives the go-ahead to the quest for Atlantis and the Canaries in autumn 1939. But when war breaks out in September, the planned expedition is fatal. Franco is now firmly in power in Spain. And what he doesn't want to happen is to be drawn into what he sees as Germany's war. So he refuses Himmler permission to dig in the Canary Islands. Himmler's quest for Atlantis has sunk without a trace. But Himmler's not done yet. As World War looms, Himmler sends another acolyte on a bizarre quest to prove the Aryan descendants of Atlantis could be found in Tibet. The theory goes that the lost Atlanteans took refuge in the high mountains of Bolivia and Tibet. So Himmler funded expeditions to both of those places, which I'm sure everyone will agree is money well spent. So Himmler finds a German anthropologist called Bruno Bega and he packs him off to Tibet. Bega's task is to go around Tibet measuring the heads of the local people in order to prove that their skull sizes are equivalent to those of Aryans. In that case, proving that the Atlanteans really did find refuge in Tibet. Bega brought back 376 skull measurements. 
which Himmler planned to compare against the skulls of Jewish Untermenschen to prove that Aryans were superior. It's very easy to sort of dismiss the activities of the Arne Nerba and a man like Bruno Bega as a classic comic book villain. But actually, the reality is very dark. We can't forget that these comic book villains were actually amoral psychopaths. We next see Bruno Bega in Auschwitz, where he's identifying inmates who have got the uh, skull measurements that he desires. And these people have obviously not been eating properly. So what does he do with them? He fattens them up. When they're sufficiently fattened up, they gas them, they murder them. And then he peels away their flesh to leave just their skeletons behind. And they could be placed in an exhibition in Strasbourg of comparative body types, comparing Aryans and non-Aryans. All of this was designed to prove that the Aryans were descended from a master race that had risen from Atlantis. This is no longer the stuff of a comic book. This is truly sick. The thing about Himmler is that if he's desperate enough to believe that the Canary Islands are Atlantis, then he's desperate enough to do some really sick and amoral things to prove that his concept of this world ice theory is correct. And, and what you have is the lunatics running the asylum. As the war draws to a close, Himmler orders the Arna neighbor's documents buried deep in a cave, alongside the tombs of the greatest warlords of the Aryan race, ready to rise again. That cave was uncovered at Bernterrode. Ultimately, the Nazis were brought down by their own arrogance, and in this too, they match Atlantis. It's actually beautifully ironic that the Nazis picked Atlantis as the birthplace of their, their own master race. Because Plato created the idea of Atlantis to demonstrate a society brought down by its own militarism and hubris. But the Nazis were so arrogant and blind to what they were, they couldn't possibly see this. And I can honestly say that it couldn't have happened to a nicer bunch of people. Coming up, she was a darling of the silver screen. Everybody loves Audrey Hepburn, but her parents were Nazi sympathizers. Her mother attended the Nuremberg rallies. Her father supported the black shirts. She was a teenage spy. If the Nazis had found out what she'd been doing, she would have been shot. Hello, I am Audrey Hepburn. Audrey Hepburn. Her name conjures images of sun, smiles and romance. Audrey Hepburn is iconic. She's one of the great romantic stars of our age. Who doesn't love Breakfast at Tiffany's My Fair Lady, Roman Holiday? But there was nothing romantic or bright about Audrey's upbringing during the Second World War. Tell us about the war. Wasn't it pretty awful? Yes, it was very bad. Because Audrey Hepburn spent her teenage years working for the resistance in Nazi occupied Holland. And what about the Germans? What do they do about it? What do know about it? May 1940. Nazi Germany invades the Netherlands. Watching their new occupiers march into her hometown of Arnhem is a young girl called Edda van Heemstra. This is the young Audrey Hepburn. The daughter of an English businessman, Joseph Rushton, and a Dutch aristocrat, the Baroness von Heemstra Hepburn. When the war breaks out, her parents have divorced and her mother decides that it will be safer to go back to her homeland in the Netherlands because it's neutral. How wrong she was. When the Germans invaded, the Baroness changed Audrey's name to Edda and forced her to speak Dutch for fear of anti-British reprisals. It did 
would take long for young Audrey and her mother to learn the true nature of the monsters who had occupied their land. Initially, Audrey and her mother were allowed to stay in the ancestral home of Castle Zippendal, but things got worse and worse. Audrey is witness to exactly what the Nazi invasion is all about. She sees men being lined up and shot, Jews being mistreated in Arnhem. Audrey also said, don't discount everything you read about the Nazis, because the truth is, it was far, far worse. This was nothing compared to what Audrey witnessed later, as the Nazis became more confident of their control. In 1942, when she was just 13, the danger of working for the resistance came much closer to her. Audrey was under no illusions as to what could happen to you if you were caught by the Nazis doing something you weren't supposed to. She could see it in her own family. She has one brother taken off to um, an internment camp in Berlin and they never see him again. Another has to go into hiding. Her uncle is rounded up and shot after an explosion that um, takes out a German troop train and um, that has been caused by the Dutch resistance. And his son too is later arrested and executed. Despite the deadly danger, it's experiences like this that convinced Audrey to start supporting the resistance. It began with ballet. Audrey was a keen ballet dancer and she says that she designed evenings to raise money for the resistance when they would have recitals with her friends from the Arnhem Conservatory. I did give performances to collect money for the underground, which always needed money. What about the Germans? What did they do about it? There's no know about it forbidden to gather in groups so they do these little performances with the blackout blinds pulled down and they gather in someone's house. To people on the outside all they heard was the piano music which was fine. And so you have this almost farcical situation in which Audrey and her fellow ballet dancers are putting on these shows for people and the people watching them aren't even allowed to clap. And what Audrey later said was that the best audience that she ever had didn't applaud her when she finished her performance. Members of the resistance would attend these black performances. At these gatherings, they would give messages to the girls, knowing that they would see other members of the resistance so that they could become couriers. And so it's thought that this is a way in which Audrey became a courier for the resistance. By 1943, the 14-year-old Audrey was ferrying messages and false identity papers to members of the resistance. In this, she was helped by the frugality of her mother. During the war, shoes were very tightly rationed, as were all leather goods, and Audrey's mother, in order to save money, bought her daughter a pair of boots that were about two sizes too big for her. What she would do would, would be to stuff messages and papers into the empty space in her boots. And the German guards never suspected that this lanky teenager on her bicycle with her big boots was smuggling secret resistance papers. Some say that her most dangerous mission came about because she could speak English. She's tasked by the resistance to go and deliver a message to an English airman who's hiding in some woods. Audrey, of course, can speak English, so she's the perfect candidate for the job. The Nazis are closing in on him. Audrey volunteered at once and wandered into the forest, picking flowers as she went. So she thinks, cunningly enough, as cover, what could be more natural than for a girl my age to be picking flowers? And then she goes and sees the airman, passes on the message, and then walks out the wood clutching these flowers. On her way out of the woods, she's stopped by a patrol of German soldiers. And, you know, she is obviously really, really nervous because she knows what she's just done. They ask her what she's doing. So she puts on this impeccable performance where she coyly hands them this bouquet of flowers and smiles and she's got no idea what they're talking about. And to her surprise, they just pat her on the head, take the flowers, and then she's on her way. This is a great example of the young Audrey Hepburn's fantastic acting abilities. Though this was probably the most dangerous job she did for the resistance, Audrey came closest to death in 1945. 
In March 1945, the Allies are beginning to push the Germans out of the Netherlands. Audrey hides in the cell of our house with her mother as the fighting continues above them. There's shelling going on and house to house fighting. And she says that you would just keep your head down and every now and again stick it up and see how much of your house was still standing and then go back into hiding. By this point, food is scarce and the 16-year-old Audrey was suffering from malnutrition. The winter of 1944 is called the Hunger Winter. Because the Germans blockaded Holland and stopped supplies getting into the country, and any food stuff, anything remotely useful, would be diverted straight to the German army and not the Dutch population. Audrey is so malnourished that she weighs something like 90 pounds. Her body was racked with conditions like jaundice, edema and anemia. So she was in a poor way by the end of the war. I think that's why Audrey Hepburn was so passionate about supporting organisations like UNICEF that helped the sort of unwitting victims of war who, who happened to be caught in its path. After the war, Audrey eventually emigrated to Hollywood, where she became an international superstar. Despite her fame, she rarely spoke about her experiences during the war. Tell us about the war. Wasn't it pretty awful? Yes, it was very bad. She very much feels that it's not something that should be talked about in public and it shouldn't sort of aid her career in any way. Some actually believe that she disliked talking about it because she was never really a spy. The Dutch Airborne Museum carried out a long and extensive investigation and they concluded there was simply no evidence that Audrey had ever been a spy for the resistance. I don't think that's surprising. Covertly carrying courier messages backwards and forwards, would there be any record of it? I don't think so. Unless they had somebody who actually remembered giving paperwork to a young Edda von Himstra, who was ever going to make the connection with Audrey Hepburn? For my mind, it doesn't matter one way or another whether she was formally part of the resistance. It seems absolutely likely to me that she did her bit. And who doesn't want to think of Holly Golightly as a Dutch resistance spy against the Nazis? Coming up, the Russian tech girl who's out for revenge. She sells all of her possessions and uses that money to buy a tank. The formidable female flyers who strike without warning. And the Germans call them Nachthexen, night witches. And the she-devil sniper with more than 300 kills. She's so deadly, the Nazis call her the Angel of Death. There's an army on the move, a monstrous regiment. They have names like Night Witches and the Angel of Death. When Russia runs out of men, it's women step into the breach. One even sells all of her possessions, including her fillings, and uses that money to buy a tank. They say hell has no fury like a woman's fury. They are the one. This woman's out for revenge, and the Germans don't know what's going to hit them. aircraft, 3,000 tanks, 7,000 artillery pieces. All of this is heading Stalin's way. This is the biggest invasion ever. Caught up in this chaos, a Russian officer, Ilya Oktavraskaya, and his wife, Maria. Married since 1925, the couple are dedicated to the Red Army. Maria is fiercely patriotic. She, she once wrote, marry a serviceman and you serve in the army. Ilya is immediately called to the front, while Maria joins the ranks of refugees fleeing eastwards to Siberia. They will never see each other again. At the outset of Operation Barbarossa, Soviet casualties were staggering. 400,000 casualties in the first month alone. 
They're killing Soviet troops in vast numbers. By the end of 1941, that figure has crept up to three million. Just two months into this bloodshed, Iliad is killed during the fighting for Kiev in August 1941. Amidst the fog and chaos of war, it takes a full two years for news of his death to reach Maria. Maria goes absolutely berserk with grief. But she doesn't just channel it into self-pity. She writes a letter directly to Joseph Stalin, saying, I want revenge on the fascist dogs who did this, and all the other fascist dogs and barbarians who've killed so many of our people. She's not alone. The barbaric Nazi policies in the East have alienated any goodwill they may have had as liberators against the Soviet regime. And this sentiment animates so many Soviet people, many of which are women. It is now 1943. The Soviets have finally turned the Nazi tide at the Battle of Stalingrad and are ready to launch a massive counterattack. And Maria has a plan. She sells all her possessions, and I mean all. That includes the fillings in her teeth, and she uses that money to buy a tank. And she wants to take that tank herself, join the Red Army, and use it to personally avenge the death of her husband. When Maria asks permission to pay for a tank and take it to the front, the Soviet authorities spot a propaganda coup, and they set her up with a T-34 tank, and she does indeed take it to the front. Maria is not the first woman in the Russian army to fight on the front line, alongside her male comrades. Women first enter the Red Army in October 1941, when Stalin creates three women's Air Force units. Stalin was petitioned directly by the legendary aviator Marina Raskova to form the 588th Night Bomber Regiment. They're given incredibly primitive canvas biplanes, which are actually meant for crop dusting rather than combat. No armor and no radio. They sound like death traps. But actually, these planes work to their advantage. They can cut the engines as they're approaching the enemy lines and use the planes to glide noiselessly over the front lines and drop bombs. This image of a female fighter pilot, she silently glides through the air. This conjured up uh, an, an association with witches. The Germans call them Nachthexen, night witches. Over the course of four years, the night witches flew over 30,000 missions, dropping 23,000 bombs. They become the most decorated unit in the entire Soviet Air Force. And in fact, the Germans fear them so much that any soldier who manages to shoot down a night witch is automatically awarded an Iron Cross first class for bravery. These are only the first of the thousands of women to see combat on the Eastern Front. Even more famous than Maria is Lyudmila Pavlichenko, one of 2,000 female snipers serving in the Red Army. Lyudmila became one of the deadliest snipers of the war and kills 309 Germans and Romanians and other Axis forces. She's so deadly, the Nazis call her the Angel of Death. So Maria Oktobrskaya is in good company when she volunteers for her revenge mission. The Soviets very quickly recognize a great propaganda coup. They fit her out with a T-34 tank, which she christens the Fighting Girlfriend, and she paints that name on the side in white paint. And she is put in the front lines, right alongside the men, to carry the war to the Germans. But the rest of her unit is less than impressed because the other troops don't like being around a publicity stunt. After all, they're in probably the bloodiest conflict in human history, and suddenly they've got this whacking great target for the Germans to aim at. Maria's first opportunity to prove herself on the 21st of October, 1943, in the city of Smolensk. The Red Army have recently liberated Smolensk from two years of occupation. But the Germans clung to the outskirts of the city. And it's the job of Maria's unit to drive them out. 
Maria drives the fighting girlfriend deep into the action. And she takes out an anti-tank gun, she takes out a machine gun nest, over 30 soldiers. As she fights the tank through all of this, she sustains damage. And her tank tracks are put out of action. Okchervaskaya dismounts from the vehicle, exposing herself to the gunfire, and repairs the vehicle so it can get back into action. She's utterly indomitable. She's actually proving herself to be a proper leader of men. Everyone around her is immediately invested with respect for what she had done that day at Smolensk, and they begin referring to her as mother. Maria becomes the standard there for, for the Russian fight back uh, against the Germans, and she's driven by her desire for revenge. The Nazis, after all, killed her husband. She then writes home, I beat the bastards, and sometimes I'm so angry I can barely breathe. However, such recklessness comes at a price. On the 17th of January, 1944, Maria and her tank are sent on a very risky nighttime attack outside the town of Vitebsk. She leads the tank into a position where they're engaging Germans in infantry fighting positions. The fighting girlfriend crosses German lines, destroying machine gun posts and anti-tank nests until she's finally hit by an anti-tank round. And again, she dismounts with the objective of repairing that damage so that the vehicle can go back into action. She manages to do so, she clambers back on board. But then she's hit in the head by a piece of shrapnel as she's getting back into the tank. She's rushed to a hospital just outside Kiev, which poignantly is the city where her husband was killed. And she reigns in a coma for two months, and then she dies on the 15th of March, 1944. In recognition for her conspicuous acts of gallantry under fire, Okchabaskaya is admitted to the hero of the Soviet Union, which is the highest award for individual valor that a Soviet soldier can receive. Many of her female comrades are not treated with such honor. The problem was, in the eyes of quite a few Russian men, was that this female involvement in the Red Army had tarnished ideas of femininity. And in order to put them back into their box, these women had to be treated and regarded as whores. But no amount of abuse can detract from what these extraordinary women achieved. They, they beat back the Nazi menace when it all seemed lost. You only have to look at this piece of graffiti that was daubed up in charcoal on the ruins of the Reichstag in 1945. And it read, you were beaten by a Russian girl. The British are outnumbered by more than three to one. Only a miracle can save them now. The miracle that comes contains divine inspiration. Britain is fighting on the side of the angels, and the events at Mons prove it. Do you believe in angels? They did in World War One. Everyone in Britain is talking about it. You have soldiers writing into newspapers saying they saw the angels. I saw it. I was there. I was a witness to what happened. Most people believe the British really had been helped by an angel. With their backs against the wall, Britain's tiny army is saved by a heavenly host. The British are outnumbered by more than three to one. Only a miracle can save them now. And it happens at Mons. Twenty second of August, nineteen fourteen. At the beginning of World War One, the British Expeditionary Force, known as the BEF, digs in around the Belgian town of Mons. At this point in the Great War, the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, is about 70,000 soldiers, and they've been sent to protect Belgium against German invasion. In the grand scheme of things, the BEF in 1914, in August, is a very small component. The French put the BEF on the northern flank. They're there to stop the Germans coming around the front line. 
and they're really thinking they're going to be facing a force slightly larger, perhaps 100,000, no more than that. They have no idea what they're getting into. Because Allied High Command has miscalculated. They don't know that actually the Germans are performing a massive manoeuvre to try and swing down through Flanders and then march south on Paris and completely knock the French, the British, the Belgians out of the war. Instead of facing an army of just 100,000 men, the BEF is faced with a staggering 240,000 men. They're now outnumbered by three to one. The one thing that favours the British is the fact that all of their soldiers are trained with their new weapon, the short magazine Lee Enfield. They have to pass this thing called the Mad Minute Test, in which they've got to fire off 15 aimed rounds at a target 300 yards away and hit it. That's one shot every four seconds. That's phenomenal. Despite inflicting massive casualties upon the advancing Germans, the odds are completely against them. And then we've got wave after wave of attackers coming. And the British, all they can do is just keep firing. It's, it's like a zombie apocalypse. And really, at this point, only a miracle is going to save them. And then, the miracle comes. The story that follows is quite amazing. Just as the British line was about to break, there's this huge, bright white light in the sky above the German lines. Some people say it's a force of, of archers from centuries gone by. While others say it's this sort of host of angelic warriors. Whatever they are, they're actually inspirational. With the aid of these spectral warriors, this galvanised the British troops. And it gives the British hope. It was enough to hold back the German tide. But it wasn't enough to turn it. The British position is utterly untenable. You're looking at nearly a quarter of a million Germans all lined up, ready to get them. So the commander of the BEF gives the instruction, an orderly retreat. Screening the retreat was a unit of Coldstream guards. They're there to help the rest of the British expeditionary force get away. The paranormal stories continue as the unit of Coldstream guards find themselves in Mormal Forest. They're basically trapped there. They have no option but to try and dig in. But out of the gloom, they see an angel, a figure, illuminated. And this female figure beckons to them. She directs them to this sunken lane, which none of them had seen. And the sunken lane leads them out of the forest and to safety. This was the last reported sighting of what becomes known as the Angels of Mons. Once this story comes out in Britain, everybody is convinced that something miraculous has happened. Most were convinced that the BEF really had been helped by an angel. God intervened to make sure that the British Expeditionary Force was not defeated. But none of this happens until two months after the event. The account is actually a story by Arthur Machen which appears in the London Evening News on the 29th of September 1914. The story Machen tells is that of this army of ghostly longbowmen. Letting fly with thousands of arrows. Invoking the spirit of Agincourt and thousands of Germans fall to these mysterious arrows. And of course, what does this tell the British soldiers? It shows that on St George's Day, the spirit of England's patron saint has come to help them. The men from Agincourt have returned and beaten the enemy. Machen says that he was inspired to write the story when he read accounts of British riflemen holding the line at Mons. But almost immediately, it takes on a life of its own. People start writing in, asking for details of the soldiers who'd witnessed what was a story by Machen. Now Machen keeps protesting, says, look, it's just a story, but there's nothing he can do. By now, it's spreading wider and wider until it reaches the troops on the front line. You have soldiers suddenly writing into newspapers saying that they saw the angels, they saw the bowmen. You have people obsessively reading this. And once clergymen start 
giving sermons on this idea of the, the miracle, the, the, the angel of Mons, it, it doesn't take long really for the story actually to become not just Bowman, but actually it's the angels that save the army. The more Machen denied the story of angels, the more people defended it. I feel sorry for Machen, because essentially what he's done is just produced this short story about Bowman on the battlefield, and it's gone spiralling out of all control. Machen is told that he's not being patriotic, because he says it's just a story. People already start publishing books saying that the legend is true, and Machen is now lying. And then obviously there are conspiracy nuts coming along and saying that the government are trying to orchestrate a cover-up. And the government says, well, no, it didn't happen, and and then people start saying, ah, quite clearly, this is a conspiracy, which proves that it did happen, because you're saying that it didn't. Still, surely there's no smoke without fire. The soldiers who say they saw the angels can't all be wrong, can they? Talk to any historian about the Angel of Mons, and they will all point out that all the reports are third-hand. They're all Chinese whispers. Yet surely this cannot explain the angelic vision who led the Coldstream Guards to safety. You might assume that it's supernatural, but isn't it more likely that actually the person that they saw is a local girl or young woman with a lamp who would look ethereal in the dark? And it was she who would have guided the unit to safety. If enough men have seen it, then maybe you can't say that there was nothing there. In their exhausted state, very few actually would see this figure. But in the telling, the story would grow and grow and grow. And of course, by the time it gets back to England, this little girl has become not just a metaphorical angel, but a real angel. Maybe this should not surprise us. In 1915, the British people had good reason for grasping at any straw of hope. By 1915, the reality of the war is starting to sink in. The Lusitania has been sunk with the loss of civilian lives. They've survived annihilation at Ypres the year before. You've got the disaster of Gallipoli. Add to that, poison gas has been used and the Zeppelins are bombing London and other cities. So it's not surprising that the British population are looking for little pieces of good news and embellishing them as much as they can. And along comes this story that, that's overwhelmingly positive and justifies what's happening and people just seize it and, and get completely carried away. So in the dark days of the war, a story which invoked the iconic victory at Agincourt to help avert a great disaster was bound to have a powerful resonance. Let's face it, Britain is very, very good at plucking some shred of evidence of victory from the, the, the jaws of disaster. And we like turning defeats into what look like victories. We can always say, actually, it was our finest hour. Britain is fighting on the side of the angels, and the events at Mons prove it.